Welcome back to What Would You Ask podcast. My next guest, another one of those folks that dared to get into the kitchen, Hell's Kitchen, season one. And for you folks that are out there and saying, you know, I, I like Nick's podcast, but I'd really like to hear some of the people from the earlier seasons instead of season 10 or 12. I got season one for you. I mean, come on. What, what do you want? I got, and I've had three or four of them, I think. Who won season one, Carolyn? Do you remember? Uh, yeah. Who was that? I don't remember <laughs> either. Anyway, was it Christine? No. She won three, I think, or four. Michael. Michael. Oh, Michael. That's right. The guy with the knives and he's got yeah. this tattoo. Yeah, he's tattoo. the knife guy. That's right. He's coming on. So let's not start oh. worrying about who Nick brings to the table. Uh, my next guest appeared on Fox hit show Hell's Kitchen season one. And she's also a critically acclaimed actress and comedian, which I find to be one I'm jealous of because I want to be a critically acclaimed actress and comedian uh, or actor. Um, but that's pretty darn cool, right? Carol Ann Valentino, welcome to What Would You Ask podcast. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to bring your talents and skills, even though you weren't a trained, necessarily a trained chef, and go on Hell's Kitchen. So, uh, the, the, well, I, I was at the time uh, one of the people in charge of running a $40 million, well, $37 million steakhouse in the heart of Manhattan at the time. It was the mecca of like the movers and shakers of the world were there. Uh, publicly traded company. We did more sales in that restaurant, one of the top, top highest grossing restaurants in the world, one wow. of the top top 20, I believe, top 10 in the U.S. Um, so a lot of people would come through the restaurant. And so I had a lot of friends in the entertainment industry, law, you name it. And so the, the casting directors for Hell's Kitchen would come in frequently to the restaurant. And I uh, would be working and they would be like, just watching you work is like a television show. Like it is unbelievable. And they're like, you gotta audition for this show that we're doing. And I'm like, no, really, it was like, I'm busy. I can't, you know, and they're like, you got to do it. And I'm like, but I don't want to. They're like, but you have to, it's about the restaurant industry. And, uh, and they talked to me a little bit more about, you know, being a chef. And I'm like, I'm not a chef. So why are we having this conversation? And she said, it's not. It's not about just being a chef. We're looking for people that do front of the house, back of the house. It's just about the industry. And because it was the first season, I didn't have anything to compare it to. So I went on camera with the idea in my mind of, I'm not going to be on the show. I'll just do her a favor <laughs> and answer their questions. So there were a couple camera guys and, um, they were like, you know, do you know who Gordon Ramsay is? And I'm like, no. Does he know who Carol Ann Valentino is? <laughs> and they would laugh. And they're like, oh, he's a he's award winning chef and owns, you know, several, you know, twelve million dollar restaurants. And I said, well, good for him. Uh, uh, I'm running a thirty seven million dollar restaurant. And next question. <laughs> and they're like, well, he, you know, he's very intense and. Uh, uh, you know, he's very intimidating, has a temper. I said, let me just stop you. Uh, you could throw a couch at my head in the middle of service and I'll duck and continue working. I'm not impressed. I'm not intimidated. Good for you. I said, you want to see my temper? We'll talk about temper. And so camera guys start laughing. I go, do you need me to like be normal? And they're like, no, just do your thing. So uh, those are the type of questions they would ask. And they're like, well, you know, he's, you know, all about high standards. I go, look, he said, uh, they were saying how, you know, it's very intense atmosphere. I go, you tell him to come to my restaurant and we'll see if he can run this restaurant. I said, you pump out 1,500 meals at dinner time, five-star service, without anybody coming out with their trays, with back waiters, the server's doing everything. No, you tell me if you can run that without even being able to walk through the crowd to get to the kitchen to make your own meal appetizers, which is what our staff has to do. So if you want to talk about delivering high level service at the extreme level of like not having all this extra support, I go, that is service. 
So they were like, oh, I was like, next question. So I'm like, oh, good, I'm done. You know, they're not interested. And they're like, well, have you ever cooked? I said, I grew up cooking. I mean, I grew up with a mother who's better than any, any meal I've ever had. I don't care what famous chef you are. I said, my mother is a, an Italian cook, makes the homemade pasta, does real sauce, you know, makes dishes up, you know, chicken Valentino, which is another podcast. But I was like, I'm used to fine food. <laughs> I'm not impressed with anybody else. And so that's how that went. And then um, they were like, thank you so much for doing that. I was like, great. I go back to work. And at the time, I was working as a comic and running this place. Uh, and we worked insane hours on our feet, 32,000 square foot restaurant that was never, you never have time to breathe, never a moment to like take a beat. And so I remember just working, working, and then I got a call and they're like, you know, you got called back. I'm like, call back for what? And they're like, you got back to the Hell's Kitchen. And I'm like, what? I go, they know I'm not a chef. Like, I'm not, I'm not a chef. And they're like, oh, it's not about that. It's about front of the house, back of the house. Maybe some of the chefs will have to run the front. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. So I went back, auditioned again, and then they called me out to L.A. to meet with the executives. Uh, and I was like, I was on the, on the plane going, is this, is this really happening? Like, how did I get here? Like, what is going on? I thought I was living in an alternate reality. And then I, being in the executive studios, being interviewed with all these people, with these lights everywhere, I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and so they were interviewing me. And again, you know, I would show what I'm showing now, which is fearlessness and tell it like it is and not intimidated. Um, and uh, then I got a call, then I got on the show and I was like, but I'm not a chef. <laughs> and they're like, stop saying that. It's not about that. So, so that's that. That's how I ended up going on it. And in my mind, I was like, okay, a million dollar value gift at the end. I'll open uh, an Italian restaurant for my mother who growing up, that's all we heard. Cause we were raised. I'm an Italian girl, Neapolitan. That's my ancestry. We were raised, I was raised in Dallas, Texas, when my parents transplanted us from New York. So growing up during the time, you know, you know 80s or whatever, they, they didn't know what authentic Italian food was. Like we had to go down to Deep Ellum to the specialty shop to get the real tomatoes yeah, or the good, real good. cheese. Yeah. You know, and the neighbors would be like, they are just the nicest Mexicans. Aren't they so interesting? I mean, they're so light skinned and we'd be like, Oh, we're not Mexican. We love Mexicans, but we're, you know, we're Italian. And they're like, Oh my God. So y'all in the mob and stuff like that. I'm like, Jesus, we have to educate you on everything. No offense to them because that's the way Hollywood, you know, presents Italian. So, you know, they're good people. Um, but it was just funny cause we had to educate them. Because growing up, going over to my mom, be like, oh, you went over to Sally's house for lunch. What'd you have? Oh, well, we had some some tacos, and they they were the frozen tortillas with craft cheese. And she's oh, like, yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> and my friends would come over with, you you hungry? My mom would have like nine courses out, of and they'd be like, oh my god, this is so neat. <laughs> and I, in my comedy so routine, I talk about the fact that. You know, my boyfriend comes over for her big Italian Sunday meal, which is huge for Italians. Yep. Dish after dish after dish. Yep. And my mom slaved over uh, meatballs. And my boyfriend's like, Miss Neltino, do you have any A1 sauce I could try on the meatballs? <laughs> <laughs> and the, my family, my father, they're like, he's got to go. Get him out. <laughs> they're like looking at him like he's sick. <laughs> oh, my God, and that's he, so true. It's so true. Yeah, but that's how true. I ended up on the show, wanting my mom to have her own restaurant so nobody would laugh at her. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the, the, the time you were in, in Hell's Kitchen. So you did you, in preparation for it, before we get in the kitchen, um, did you watch any of the episodes? I know you weren't familiar with it when you first started going through. Did you? Prepare? Well, I was the first season. So oh, that's right. You were the first season. I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Good luck there. Um, 
<laughs> what That's why I was so nervous. I was like, what the hell am I looking at? What is going? It was petrifying, to be honest with you. So you, you go out there not knowing anything, right? You show up and you walk in the door and there's nothing obviously to compare it to your season one. And you, it's the first time we see Ramsey appear. Is that the first time you guys see him or is there other times you see him beforehand? So we saw him right before you did your him. first dish. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was, yeah. yeah. So he okay. comes down and right. the big doors open, open. and he he's walks got through. his assistant chefs yeah. and yeah. everybody's like, and what I was remember your first impression of him. Very, very, uh, cause I read people really well, which is why I was a great manager. Yeah. Um, I could read you a mile away and he is extremely charismatic and very powerful in his presence. You know, all you have to do is just stand there. You don't have to try to yeah. be anything. Yeah. So that's what I remember thinking of like, wow, like I like his presence. He's he taller than me he on TV. He's tall as shit. Yeah. He's so tall. Yeah. He reminds me a little bit of like the Rocky movie with the, the Russian guy, the, the box, the one that went against I'll go, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. He's got, kind yeah. of got that big, tall, like scary look. Yeah. <laughs> So he tells you guys, and again, we, we only see the edited version, but he tells you guys, okay, right, basically right away, go in and make your, you know, your best meal. I'm going to taste it. I want to see what kind of crew I have, or brigade, so, brigade. Exactly. And I have to give it up for my mother because we, we, I'm like, they're definitely going to throw us to the wolves on day one and make us cook something. And in my mind, because uh, I'm very intuitive like i have a strong sense of stuff i'm like they're going to probably make it hard for us to like find the ingredients and you know i'm going to i'm going to make something more difficult i'm not going to make anything that's easy you know that you could just whip up i'm going to make it so i have to work and so my mom and i practice like the chicken parmesan and it's outstanding her recipe and she taught me how to do correctly which i've never had chicken parmesan done correctly uh the texture of the chicken has to be just right and it's hard to do yeah. and so especially when you're under the gun on a tv show where all the lights are on and all the equipment and ingredients are hidden and, you know it was stressful because i had to make the sauce separately then i had to prep the chicken and it had to be cold chicken with perfect hot you know, oil to get the perfect fry. Then I had to find all the equipment and everybody's competing with each other. So that's so, not set up ahead of time with your stuff and your ingredients and your- Hell no, hell no. You're just running- Hell to the no. <laughs> You're like a jackass running around going, you, you got in the dirt, you know, like it was just nuts. <laughs> it was nuts. It was so, nuts. So then everybody gets it done. You put it all on a table and Gordon's, you know, pulling a dish out at a time. Are you, are, and you were, you were probably in the middle of the pack to the end. You weren't at the front of the pack. No, right? I was at the end yeah. on purpose. Yeah. And so he hated the, he spit out. No, he hated, he legit hated the food. Yeah. He was getting was disgusted and, yeah. and grabbed a, a bin as he calls it. We call it garbage can. And he spit out on a few occasions, some of the food he ate and he didn't taste some of the other food. And he like picked up the top and looked at it and was like, what is this? And then he asked one guy, how many, how many people is this meal supposed to feed? Like it was so much food on the plate. It was kind of a, uh, scary. Then. I just this, remember him this, calling things dog meat, dog yeah, shit. Yeah. And I was like, oh, great. And I'm like, why the fuck am I on this show? And then you walk up. He says, your name is? And you said, Carol Ann, and what do I have here? And chicken parm. And tell us what he said to you, if you remember. So he's like, this is a very beautiful presentation. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like feeling that he's like, and he cuts through it. And he goes, this is extremely tender. Yeah, cook perfectly. And he's like, yeah. It's like, yeah. this is absolutely perfect. And she's not even a chef. <laughs> makes, and I makes just those remember, executive like, chefs feel real good. <laughs> yeah, they were pissed. Yeah. And then I remember uh, watching the commercials afterward. And they would just run footage of my face because I was like this. <laughs> While he was spitting up people's food, and I was like, I'm Carol Ann. 
And I only think, I don't remember him liking, I think he liked somebody, another girl's dish, yeah. maybe a guy, one, one other one, but he was, it was not good. What happens after, because the next we see you guys, we see you back in the dorm after that, I think. I don't think we see anything else. And then we see service later on. Um, what, is that how your day went? I mean, is that what you did? You went, you're still in your street clothes when you walked in and cooked for that main right. dish. So we cleaned up. And then we got to hang out in our house and have drinks and stuff. Now, my MO, okay, I was trying to figure out, like, the reason why I was on the show is because I have credibility as a restaurant person, right? Like, all you had to do is go visit my restaurant and see what I used to do and work, see the people I worked with. We worked our asses off. So my confidence in myself it's just a restaurant person was very strong. However, the, you know, I'm not a chef. So right. the intimidation of like how to make the meals was like, well, how, why am I here? But I remember thinking, well, if I'm going to be on here, I'm not going to look like a jackass. And so everyone's drinking and I'm like not drinking. And in my head, I'm like, they're going to wake us up at like three o'clock in the morning with pots and pans. And so I remember telling some of the people, which was edited out, I was like, I wouldn't get drunk if I were you because they keep giving you free booze because their ass is going to wake you up in a few hours with some pots and pans. And then sure enough, that's what ended up happening yep. the next day. Who were your shoe, sh sous chefs? I'll say that fast. Um, was, it, uh, was Scott one of them then? I don't think he was. I can't uh, remember her name. Uh, I know, I know, oh, I, I, I know yeah, who it is. Um, Oh, not Mary Ellen. I know who it is. Mary it, Ellen. Mary, that, Mary. Yeah. So there, they, so, so they wake you up, right? First of all, did your relationship or your, didn't you have a problem with one of the girls, like Elise or something? Was I it? didn't have a problem with her at all. Oh, you didn't? She had a problem but with that's, you. <laughs> that's how, that's how they want you to think. Ah. I didn't it. have a problem with anybody. Okay. So when do you, when they wake you up, you're back in the downstairs and we're seeing things real time, right? I mean, we're seeing you, you head into the kitchen and Ramsey's there waiting for you. Yeah. Intimidating guy? Uh, slightly. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's just because he's got a soft side. We see that when he goes on rewards. I mean, you, right. he, he seems yeah, to be. Yeah, it wasn't soft. It wasn't soft. He's yeah. staring at you like kind of right. get your fat asses up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> now service for you is new you're a restaurant tour you're not a line cook fair so the the restaurant service is what i do the kitchen service is not what i do that's right that's so, what i'm you yes. said it better than i did so, so that's all new to you how are you supposed to pick that up like when people even the people that do it said when you knew do it with a new brigade gordon ramsay's term um, it takes three or four weeks to get in sync with each other. Correct. So, and these are people that do it as a career. Correct. And all of a sudden comes this person that's not really well-versed in it. That's like, I mean, what did you expect? You know right. what I mean? And I remember them throwing us into scenarios and full service and prepping stuff and making stuff. And uh, I just remember feeling like a deer in the headlights, kind of like, uh, I could probably orchestrate the kitchen, meaning expedite, because uh, that's what I'm accustomed to, like being used to that in the industry of like orchestrating things, but actually going on the line and like pumping out 400 meals, you know, setting me up for failure out of the gate. How, tell us about how that service was for you. What did you, what was it like? Was it hell? I didn't um, see, it didn't seem like you were picked on a lot at, right off the get. No, you no didn't? not at all. Not at all. So I was, I was put in expediting and the dessert station, which we never actually got. Got dessert. Making right. desserts. Right. So I kept getting called. I was told to not leave the dessert station. Yep. And then I was told, yelled by Gordon to go help. And I'm like, but you told me not to leave the dessert station. So I'm like, okay. And so I'm like looking over there, making sure we're not getting a dessert so we don't get yelled at. And then I'm trying to expedite. And then I also don't know how to run some of the big, 
you know, broilers and things. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, somebody burned their hand and this person's cursing. This one fell. He's, he's screaming. And then you see a backup of the tickets coming. Yeah. So then I go over to expedite with Gordon Ramsay and you see all these customers come up, you know, and they're like, where is our meal? And he's like, go get the fuck out of here. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is like, this is more what I'm used to. Uh, but I just remember being like, what the hell? Cause the kitchen was huge. Like mo most restaurants do not have kitchens like this. Interesting. So you end up going back when you're done. I think he threw both groups out. If I'm not mistaken, I think he didn't finish service and he said right. red out, blue out, get out of here. Um, and F off and get back to your place. And then you guys go back there. Tell us a little bit of, because you, you know, you're a, a Northeast Italian uh, young lady at heart. I mean, I know you have Dallas by the way of Texas, but um, you're a good read of people. When you, there are people in there that will, would literally eat the kitchen table if you told them they can, they'd win Hell's Kitchen, right? There's different mentality than you have going in. They're fierce. So when they get kicked out of that service, they're literally enraged. Like they can't believe that they've never, they didn't get through it. And I wasn't the reason why this happened. Who's the, I mean, we got to get rid of him. Like they're really intense yep. about this, correct? Yep. It? So, yep. You, but you, there's, then there's you who's not really as emotionally attached to this as some of them. What was your, um, what did you see in there? What was that like, the discussions about who we're going to put up for a limit? Because both groups had to put up one or two, I don't remember, but they had to put up at least two. one, two, two each. Yeah. So what, what did you hear? No, I was very through? upset. I was actually very upset because, you know, you know, I am not a chef. Yeah. But if you're telling me that this is going to be more about front of the house as well, and we only got through this one thing, uh, and, and some of the chefs got to go work the dining room on that first episode, and I'm like, okay, oh, that's so right, this could be a likelihood that I could stay in the race, right? So I'm trying to figure everything out, because if you've never been behind the line working a fucking restaurant, you know, putting out meals, like, yeah. it's not easy. Like, what, yeah. do you, what would you expect somebody to be like? However, yeah. you know, were those guys ever running the front of the house? And that's where I would excel. And then by the same time as each meal goes, I'm going to learn more so I have a better advantage of maybe working in the kitchen. But because I wasn't exposed to it, it was like a crash course of one night learning yeah. how to do this. Yeah. So what, what happened to make, I, I don't, when I watched the episode last night, there was names going around of who's going to go up. Um, did you feel like you were going to be one of those people? But you, you, could, you can make a case that, well, if you got the desserts, then you can judge me. And Gramsci doesn't ask you to jump in to help out. And like for what lo we're looking at was like 15 minutes before you're, you're thrown out of the kitchen. Correct. So Correct. is it a little bit short sighted to, to eliminate you or are they just getting rid of people they felt were not quote unquote chefs? So put to you this way, this is just off the record guess. If I, uh, if I probably did the whole, uh, well, F you, Ramsey. Once you put me on the floor, I'll run the shit out of that. You know, so-and-so was lazy on the flyer. I'm sure I would have stayed in longer. You know what I'm saying? Got it. Yes, I do. Right? Yeah. So wouldn't the team want somebody who doesn't have a background in cooking to stay on longer so your chances are higher? So, um, you know, when when I was booted off, he was saying, you know, you disappointed us with your lack of teamwork. And what's funny is, is that you're not seeing all of the footage, right? You're yeah. just seeing these clips. Right. So what's funny is back home, people that know me and my work ethic, I'm the last person who's not a team player. Like that, that's not even in the realm of possibility. So that's what was like, you know, I was like, really? That's what you're going to say? But that's what you're seeing is that, 
one night of service. So. so you said this after you were eliminated. You said, I'm very angry because when, you present, when you're presented with an opportunity to, to do something great and then you see that disappear, it's very disappointing. What did you mean by right. that? So meaning like if you're going to put, put somebody the time and effort, somebody like me in this position where you know where my strengths and weaknesses are, like you're presented something, you want to set people up for success. Right. And that is how I, as a manager uh, in operations, in charge of training people, opening restaurants, you put aces in their places and you play up people's strengths and you set them up for success. And if something fails, that is on you at the top. When you smell little, when you see little cockroaches, there's lots of cockroaches at the top. So when I, I used to go into other restaurants, this is a perfect example, I would go in other restaurants just on my day off to eat and I would experience horrific service and I wasn't trying to be rude, but I would, you know, say something after a half hour without getting a drink, I'd be like in a restaurant that it was only 500 square feet. I'm like, why am I not getting a drink? And the manager's just standing there watching, not really doing anything. And he says, oh, I'm sorry you didn't get your drinks. You know, we're understaffed. We have this. He's telling me what his issues are. I said, can I just stop you? I said, this is my day off. I said, we just opened a so-and-so restaurant. I said, this is your fault. I said, this all stems from you, lack of leadership from the top. You're in charge of training them. You're in charge of operations. You orchestrate the ship. You decide where the ship goes. So look at yourself. And I gave him my business card. I said, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm trying to help you. We're on the same team. We're in this industry. You look bad. I look bad. Here's my card. Come visit me on a slow night, which is like, you know, Tuesday or whatever. He comes up to, he actually showed up. I bought him a meal and his eyeballs popped out of his head because I explained to him, our servers not only take orders, they make their own shrimp platters, deliver appetizers and entrees for the whole restaurant, family style service, and they have to give five star service and get $10,000 bottles of wine, bring them up, open them like they're stars and smile and work 32,000 square feet with three floors and still give five star service. You can't get me a soda? You can't get me a soda? So that is a long winded answer to that is that set the person up for success. If you really want to see what's going on or, you know, I wish there was other things I could say, but I can't, but there are other aspects of this that I have answers to that I can't. So Derek from Austin, Texas asks, um, were there any parts of the show that you wish were aired and didn't end up on the edit, edit room floor? I wish that the entire footage of the first day was put out on the TV show. So you could actually see how brutal it is, uh, how you're thrown to the fire, literally, uh, what's asked of you under s extreme circumstances, uh, working with people, as you mentioned, especially in the back of the house, it's an orchestration. So the mm -hmm. conductor, the chef, sous chef, is conducting this beautifully trained orchestra who's all in tune. Their mm -hmm. instruments are fine tuned, but you're not getting that opportunity. You're being thrown literally to the fly fire. So I wish that it was the whole footage uh, more, more like the feel of what it was really like. Got it. Wendy from Seattle, Washington, similar question, but I'll still ask it for you, Wendy. Um, were there any funny... Uh, anecdotal or interesting moments that we did not see on the show? Kind of similar to Derek's question. So there was a lot of banter between us as chefs that were really, really, really funny. There were a lot of comments that people had back to Gordon Ramsay that didn't make it onto the TV show. Oh, ah, got it. So I did a lot of laughing and a lot of damn right, you know, under my breath. <laughs> which I'm like, I hope that makes it onto the show because it was it. really good to hear somebody talk back to him. Tell us your, and you did, you've spoke to this a little bit already, but we have a bunch of questions we could just sum up into one, which is after going through what you went through, your experience there, um, what were your thoughts of Gordon Ramsay? Uh, that he goes from zero to a thousand in less than a second, that he has 
you know, no tolerance for, for sloppy or he's a perfectionist Yeah. and his, his tolerance meter, there is no in between. So what you see regarding that is accurate. Um, and then he has a side that's very cool, charismatic and nice. That's a good way to put it. In the middle of the fire, it's like you do something wrong, shit's coming out. Because, you know, and, and I was watching, I know I have to watch every episode because of this gig, but, um, and my wife came in and she said, why, how could you watch this? This guy throwing F-bombs like incessantly. And I'm, I have a from tape from you, Hulu or whoever, and it's the unedited version. So it's F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. And then, you know, and she's like, how could you even stand like watching that? And I, ca- I found myself sticking up for Gordon uh, because he's tasting a lot of food. He's touching the food. He's not going to put it up and out unless it meets his standards. And he has, like you just said, he has very high level standards. And by the way, I'm sure you did at your restaurant. That's why it was so successful in $37 million because you're not going to put out crap. And he's a, you know, he's a Michelin star guy. He's one of the world's most known, if not the most, I mean, you could put uh, Wolfgang Puck and others up there, uh, Thomas Keller, there's, but Gordon's one of those guys. And so you would assume that he would want Look, does he have to jump ugly? Yeah, it's, it, he's got to, I guess, in certain ways. And it's also a TV show. Um, do you think he does that every night consistently all night? I can't imagine he does. Um, that's another question, by the way. You guys are in there. You're really cooking for 40 people, I think, or something like that. Yeah, um, really is, and that goes on a lot longer than we see. We see this edited longer. thing. He's not yelling like, the entire I think time. they were there the, uh, like a whole week, I want to say. Wow, really? It wasn't uh, – it's not what you, you – it was a um, couple of days of prepping and um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't just one day. And he's not uh, there during that. You're prepping. He's not, no, no. no, he's there for the show, for the, right. the dinner. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So it felt like I was there forever, but yes, that's what, that's why I liked working the expo with him. Like, because I'm like, he's right. Yeah. Like if that was my expertise, which I have so much respect for these guys and gals that are on there. But if you're going to do it, do it right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a great point. So you uh, are eliminated. Where do you go? I got, if I got 10 questions about that, I got, I mean, holy cow, everybody wants to know where do they go? And it seems like a consistent theme because survivor don't go, doesn't go home and amazing race doesn't go home and big break people even in the golf thing they don't go home nobody goes home because nobody wants to be seen have those contestants seen or tell their stories and your mom's the word and you sign the bible away and all that stuff but are you there for the, still the next three weeks in los angeles got it okay i'm not telling you what she said for you people that listen to audio if you are you should go join the membership and get the video but I'm not telling you what the answer is. Um, that's interesting. Um, so tell us what happens next. So you leave there. How long is it from the last day that you're on or last day you go home? Where are you living, by the way, at this time? Are you in Texas? New York City. You're in New York City. So you fly home um, whenever you just nodded to, either the day of getting eliminated or later. Um, by the way, you just go to whatwouldyouask.com, you, the letter U, not Y-O-U and find out membership things. Um, you get home, and then three months later, six months later, the premieres, and now you're able to tell people you were on the show. Are well, you I didn't st- tell anybody I was on the show. Why, because your early exit, or because you just didn't think you were? It just, just, you know, with the contract and everything, and I didn't want, you know, I was eliminated on the first thing. Why? Why? Nobody's going to notice. The only people that knew were the ones that had to agree not to say that I was going on the show. Right. That's it. Got it. And okay. so I remember being like, you know, I'm going to be on the down low with this, not telling anyone. L- little did I know that the show would be rated number one in that time slot of all time, I believe. Some crazy thing like that. So everywhere I went, I went to go to work for the first day after I came home. And I got in a cab. And I was like, oh, please take me to Donuts on so-and-so. And the cab driver looks, and he looks, and he's like, 
you're chicken parmesan girl chicken <laughs> parmesan and i was like oh my god and then i remember one of the, the one of the customers that was one of our regulars i didn't tell him i was going on the show and uh and he he was uh had a guest with him and he goes shut the hell up the guy looked up and he goes we were talking about you at the golf course yesterday chicken parmesan and he goes what are you talking about she was on hell's kitchen oh i walked through the restaurant you know you know greeting people and they're like oh, that's the chicken parmesan girl so i was like there goes that idea of being well, on the down low <laughs> well there are a couple things you're you are you hold the record for and nobody will ever take away you're the first contestant to receive a positive review during the signature di signature dish dish uh, uh, no one's ever done it. No one ever can. Now the, the, you're the first, and then you're the first contestant that was nominated for elimination in the show, and the first contestant in history um, to be eliminated. So I mean, even though that's not great that it happened, it's part of the history. Now they're what they're doing. I think they're coming out in January with like season twenty or nineteen and twenty. I mean, that's this thing's going on, going to keep uh, keep on rolling. Um, so. Talk, let's, what's going on with you? I mentioned the acclaimed actress. I had the opportunity to view uh, your show. Very impressed. Um, and I did not know that until all the research for this interview came up that you were um, a comedian and an actress and critically acclaimed. And the, the clips that I saw was really funny. And it was really cool to see. I've never really seen a one-person show that actually can go from one character to the next to the next. And it looks like there's three people there. I've saw a couple that made that effort. Um, and I wish them well, as I was exiting 20 minutes into a two hour show. Um, but you, it was really impressive. Tell everybody about what happened post tank and you don't have to start with what I asked you, but tell us a little bit about where you went and what you did. So I became, I want to say pretty successful in the restaurant industry and was making a very nice living. And I was, pretty well known in that kind of industry. Those of us who worked in that particular restaurant and, you know, I had gained a lot of respect from restaurant people. Um, and, um, you know, you, you have, I'd like to say opportunities in life where you have a crossroads, right? A fork in the road. And we have the ability to have free choice and something that my mother always taught me is that you always have to not go with your head, go with your gut. And when things start to not feel like they're vibing right, you got to figure out why that is and take action. And so I'm a believer of being the ultimate risk-taking mindset. At, at being a single woman, you know, by choice, I wouldn't be single and pursue my career and make my own money and nothing wrong with people that want to get married, but I didn't want to do that. And I was running this crazy place with my, my fellow team, uh, fellow managers like me, and uh, doing well, 401k, health benefits, cush job. Like, why the hell would you leave that? Like, who would be dumb enough to leave that? And I did. I took a leap of faith, and I said, you know, you know, things are not the way they should be. And so I'm going to take a leap of faith. And I'm going to create, a uh, couple months later, I had the idea of creating, taking all my stand-up comedy material, my experience in the restaurant, putting it into a one-woman musical where I play 18 characters, all true factual events that happened to me as a manager. And I put it in a musical, and it's, it's uh, you know, males and females equally vibe the show. Um, and I've been reviewed maybe... I want to say over a hundred so on times, but one of my favorite reviews was somebody saying this is a female version of Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential, front of the house. Wow. And it's, it was a huge compliment. Yeah. Um, I forget what newspaper said it, but that's kind of the vibe of it, right? And so I am portraying all these situations. Like there was a situation where a famous TV anchor got drunk and grabbed my female body parts. So I kick him out. And it's the maitre d', myself, and the drunk news anchor doing like a song, you know, and I'm playing all these characters, Amazing. trying to take them out. So the show was uh, an inspirational, comedic, entertainment uh, 
piece, but it drove home a message of you have to be true to yourself, kind of like what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. you, and take risks. Mm -hmm. Life is not anything if you're not willing to take risks. And I've, you know, as a comic, getting up and, you know, being a female comic, I came up in the industry with Amy Schumer and everyone, and like, you know, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is popular now. That shit is accurate. Being in New York, being a female, and doing stand-up comedy, very accurate. And it takes guts to do something you really want to do that you're afraid of doing. And every night I would go up and do my one-woman show, I would be petrified. And so I remember uh, touring that in, you know, throughout Canada and the U.S. And it, thank you, God, it uh, really resonated with audiences. And I ended up selling out everywhere uh, the show went pretty much. And I got an award for being best of show or something of that sort. So I ended up with tons of awards for it. And I was on my path to doing it off Broadway in New York right before the COVID hit. Mm. But, you know, I, what can I tell you? I have a... Um, a uh, online TV show that was supposed to be a regular TV show prior to COVID that I produced, co-produced um, with another production company. And it's basically a talk show with comedy that's kind of self-help. I'm not going to tell you much more than that, but it's called Bring Your Own Baggage. We'll help you dump it. Uh, <laughs> and so I am the ringleader in that. And uh, it's a unique, it's a unique show that'll get you pumped up, positive, I'll give you some tools to thrive. Meanwhile, try to entertain you at the same time. That's cool. And I'm super excited about it. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for your time and taking us through your journey. And we wish you continued success and congratulations on all the success you've had. Oh my God, it's been unbelievable. Um, I'd like to have Work hard, it. man. Play big, work hard, take risks. Don't listen to the naysayers. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be back with more What Would You Ask podcast in a second.